just before we dig into it, um, I'm Simon Clark. I'm a member of the EGU um, in the EGU office. I just want to start us with a um, quick highlight of the EGU code of conduct. Um, so as part of our code of conduct, the EGU values uh, diversity and equality and sees it as uh, essential to ensure a respectful approach to scientific research. Uh, we don't tolerate discrimination, harassment or intimidation, and anyone who be behaves in such a manner will be removed from this webinar. Um, this webinar is about informing and also encouraging constructive discussion over implementing LGBT uh, plus networks. So please keep questions within that remit and keep discussion polite and in good faith. So with that over, I'll just hand over to Anita, if you need to like to kick off the webinar for me. So I'm Anita Di Chiara. I'm Early Career Scientist Representative for EGU, and I am postdoc in Rome and California in paleomagnetism. Thank you. Hello, I'm Mike Pryor-Jones. Uh, I'm a postdoc at uh, Cardiff University, and I'm soon to be a research fellow in the new year. Uh, I've been involved with EGU Pride for about two years um, on and off. Um, and I'll be talking to you towards the end of the presentation. Uh, I guess it's Marek now. Yeah, yeah, it's me. Yeah, I'm Marek. I'm part of EGU Pride since the beginning of the year, and I'm also um, highly involved in Apex Germany. And I currently finished my master's studies um, in ocean climate physics and now waiting to relocate to Finland to start there my PhD. And we would then just start with the presentation. Um, you see here today, it's we give a short introduction first, or like short introduction on why we build a network and why LGBTQ networks are important. And then we have a presentation of tools and techniques. And at the end, we have a round for questions. And yeah, we can talk about also your experiences with networking and or your questions in regards to what we experienced with the techniques we use now in EGU Pride. And if we continue with the next slide, thank you. Um, so just um, to maybe shortly outline why, why building a network is important, the current state, so the information from this slide is from the Exploring the Workplace for LGBT plus physical scientists and it was published in 2019, so it's rather recent, by the Institute of Physics, Royal Astronomical Society and Royal Society of Chemistry in the UK. And this survey is actually up for, like it's a PDF, you can get the results for everyone. It's really good made for either queer people or allies who want to get involved, what they could do to change something in their workplace. Um, it has, actually it includes kind of like a to-do list, what everybody can do. So I highly encourage everybody to look into it. But for today, I just wanted to bring you the statistics you see on the left-hand side. And it's um, uh, about people or LGBTQ people if they um, considered leaving academia or their workplace in, in research and science in regards to discrimination they experienced. And if you look at the um, left hand side there, you see 28% considered sometimes leaving. And then when we say like from overall or queer people in the study, and when we look in on the right hand side, you see that from the trans people, um, they said 20% considered leaving often science or academia um, due to discrimination. And what is great about that, um, about that um, study is that it's not only giving you the statistics, what is actually the current state, but it also gives you increased areas of increased action. And one thing they really highlight is building a visible and welcoming community. And that this is really important if stuff, um, that LGBTQ stuff is, is visible, that this is just helpful for the senior people, but also for the new people coming in. And this is kind of like why building a network is really important. And also building a network can be a visible, but also an invisible, like a visible place for the outside, but also can be just like an area for support and connection. And then we can go, yeah for connection and that is kind of like what we mean with welcoming and belonging that is kind of like um, the intermediate phase of that so we have representation matters that is also what the study highlights and we often think about representation just in things which happened in the past which is why we included here on the on the lower part to um, 
important figures from like queer researchers and scientists or trailblazers but also on the right hand side you see this um, the logo of the campaign 500 queer scientists it's basically a web page where you can browse through active people in active scientists browse through you can browse through location you can browse through what they're doing actually and see that there are a lot of people already out there and that is really important for this welcoming and belonging part to see that you're not the only one especially for early career scientists that part is really important um yeah and if we go then one further slide another thing which is more like not in the part of representation but for the kind of like i think for their own self-care or for the the benefit of each individual part of the community is that it can act as a mutual support platform so um in our case egu pride has a discord server and we will talk about that later in more detail but it can act as a safer place for exchange and support and this is just like the, the speech bubbles are just examples of of conversations we had so we can stick with the one on the left hand side is actually something i learned so i will move to finland soon and I figured that even in our small EGU pride community, there are people already living in Finland and I could connect to them and just ask random, random bits and pieces about moving to another country, which is not directly influenced by me being a queer person, but it helped me knowing that this country might be a welcoming place. And I could also ask queer related questions for the country and how they deal with stuff and so on. And that is really important. And it gives you more sense for a new country than just knowing you go there and Googling stuff about it. The other thing we, we also did or, or do sometimes is just like, if anyone is interested in a coffee break, and I think we all experience some sense of loneliness sometimes during the last years in several different places and stages of Corona lockdown. But I think it's also good to, to reconnect sometimes in your work. They just be like, okay, I could send a coffee break right now. And sometimes this works, sometimes not. And it keeps the community together. And the other one is just like you have a place where you can vent about homophobic experience, queerphobic experience or stuff like that, or just exchange and see like, okay, this happened, can we do something about it? Do we want to put our frustration into action and something like that? So this is kind of like everything which can happen under mutual support and is a good thing to do. And this is the perfect transition to hand over to Anita for what we actually did in EGU Pride. Thanks, Marek. Yes, thanks. Um, it, this is a great base uh, that inspired um, us back in 2019 to suggest having a gathering, just a very formal one, uh, during the General Assembly. And then we all moved the activities of EGU online. So, um, so I'm going to talk about it uh, in the next slide. So the first EGU Pride uh, was uh, in person. It happened at the ECS, Early Career Scientist Lounge. There is a space dedicated to early career scientists at the Vienna Centrum. And it was a socializing event to connect and, uh, and, and welcome uh, people. And next. And then, the, then the, the, um, from the first Pride event, uh, we organized a second Pride event that happened online on Zoom. It was, uh, it was socializing, it was a very good way to connect to people and we, we started thinking of topics that we can develop and things that we can do together within G EGU and beyond. Next, please. Um, I can copy and paste here some like, um, Mentimeter responses when we asked participants. That, um, so what was the experience in a academic career how the, how uh, being a queer scientist affected the career. And the, um, the responses were, of course, some positive and some negative, uh, with feeling of isolation and difficulties in uh, with finding role models, uh, not knowing uh, where, if you can open up in your working place with your, uh, with your professor, with your colleagues. Um, so it can be scary sometimes when you move to new countries and you don't know how that is um, going to affect how you interact with the working uh, community. Um, sometimes it's actually a positive experience and fin when finally people 
can open themselves up. Um, next, please. Um, and the, so uh, these are some of the responses extracted, and uh, we also asked other questions. But the the feeling was that we wanted to we wanted to kind of inquire more on how we can connect to the community that is existing uh, within EGU and what can we do together. Um, so in 2020, we uh, we ran the same as me to ask the same question, and it. it how how uh, being queer scientists affected the career? Um, it feels uh, it feels uh, uh, not so safe to be on field work. Maybe go and work and accept a job in in countries where it's not so very welcoming. Um, and also we you know you you need you also need support and support can come from allies as well. So some of the allies attended the. Um, the pride event and say as an ally i haven't had any effect but i know that some people can be affected uh in the workplace and beyond um so and sometimes it's also good to have um to have a community around and making connection with the rest of the queer community and i feel that being online this is in a way a bit uh easier maybe maybe i say um, next slide. Um, so uh, this year uh, we also run an event online, um, but the group has grown, um, and also EGU has a more formal group at, um, that is dealing with equality, diversity, and inclusion issues uh, within the structure of EGU. So um, we felt inspired to. Co coordinate with the EDI committee members. Um, and we want to actually start finally a new LGBTQIA plus uh, group. Um, so we, we, we connected the members and we finally uh, did, um, I think next slide is yours. Oh no, it's about Twitter plan, I'm sorry. Um, uh, Mike is gonna talk about it uh, more in depth, but I want to say that we want to keep um, being involved in, in, in the find and grow the community that is existing. And we plan, we hope to do for next uh, General Assembly, where, whichever the format will be, to have an online icebreaker where we can, we can meet before the assembly and talk to each other, meet each other in, in, informally online. And then we plan to have a reception if possible to, to meet, uh, and then we're gonna have the uh, EGU Pride event um, gathering, and we're gonna have a space at the EDI booth. This is all in progress. Um, for next slide. While, uh, uh, when we, 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 we first met uh, this year, we decided we wanted to do something um, for the community. Uh, I was to try and make EGU more welcoming and more representative as possible. And we went, we went and asked ourselves what we want to do about it. And so we came up with a lot of ideas, um, but we, and we focused on a on few of them uh, that are currently ongoing campaigns. Um, and then these are three examples. Uh, for instance, we wanted to, uh, to promote name changes in EGU journals. Um, that would be very beneficial for, for people that want to change their name uh, in their life due to marriages, due to, um, to uh, transitioning, uh, whichever reason we want to make sure that that is implemented in EGU journals. Uh, we can talk about it later if you have any question about that. Another thing we want to do, we will, we will try um, to do is to have a place where we can, we can have name pronunciation guidelines for session conveners that would help uh, to, to, to use the right name that you want for being presented, introduced before your scientific session. And we want to generally uh, write, raise awareness uh, for uh, our community. I listed three of long-term aspirations that we wish to, to pursue, um, but these are again more long term, so we you know we can't promise much. But we want to uh, try and get uh, gender neutral toilets at the physical general assembly, 
and in the future we would like to have pronoun budgets at the GA. Uh, we would like to work um, for a good practice guide for field work and implementing as well what is the uh, the EGU um, EGU uh, current guidelines. Um, I think this uh, the the next slide is yours now, Mike. Okay, thank you, Mike. Yeah, that's right. Sorry, I'm just need to find the right button. Thank you very much, Anita. So yeah, having introduced the group and the kinds of things that we're doing, um, I wanted to, um, yeah, I, I, I wanted to sort of talk some about some more practical ideas, some more practical tools and techniques that we use um, in terms of how do you start your own community? Obviously, you're very welcome to join EGU Pride, but there's what we wanted to try and share with some of the experiences of how you start a community so that if you wanted to start a community within your own institution within your own country um, in any circumstance um, the, the, here are some of the things that we thought about and what I want to start by saying is talking about uh, online communities versus real life um, and that I would say that we found that both sides have real strengths and weaknesses and that they complement each other very well so the value of a, an online network is that it lets you reach people across a great distance. It helps to bring together a community of people who might otherwise feel quite isolated. But on the other hand, in-person meetings are more, can be more congenial. You get to know people a lot more quickly uh, if you meet in person. Um, and so ideally, you want to be in a situation where you can meet in person occasionally and then maintain the connection online between meetings. And that has worked well for us in term, as, as an EGU network with this focus around the annual conference. But also, uh, I've seen it work well in other organisations. That's not to say that you can't do a purely in person or a purely online community, but having this kind of hybrid model works really well. And then for the rest of the webinar, I'm just going to talk about the strengths and weaknesses of some of the different online platforms and how you might think about using those online platforms uh, for running a community. So the, um, the first sort of and simplest, uh, oldest form of technology is the, is the mailing list server. Um, the one I've shown here, a screen grab from my email inbox here from Cryolist, which is a, a mailing list server for the whole of the cryospheric science community. And the wonderful thing about a mailing list is it's very low effort. Um, it's very accessible. Everyone has email pretty much. It's, uh, it's straightforward to use. And it works very well for posting announcements and making connections across the community. Um, it's less, a mailing lists are less good for discussion because everybody gets everything. Um, and so uh, what you tend to find, what we tend to find with Cryolist is that the, uh, the majority of the um, postings on it these days are announcements because there are tens of thousands of people on it, I would say. Um, uh, maybe, maybe not quite that many, but certainly, certainly, certainly thousands of people on it. And the, um, um, and you can browse it on the web, but it predominantly comes to you in the form of an email, in, in the form of your email. Um, but it's a it's a good it's a good way to run a basic community, and it uh, has the advantage of being very simple and very persistent. So moving on a bit, moving along the technology timeline a bit, um, the um, the next technology I want to talk about here is web forums, um, which have been around really since the 1990s and are very very mature technology now. And maybe have gone a little bit out of fashion, I think. Maybe um, there's newer, shinier things have come along, but. There's, there are loads of good reasons why web forums are, good, are a good idea. Um, the tech, as I say, the technology is very mature, so they are built to host very large communities with diverse interests. It's very straightforward to split up conversation on different topics so that people only see the stuff that's of interest to them. They usually have moderation tools um, um, and you, they also have kind of update and information tools so that you can uh, get an email when a particular topic that interests you gets updated. Um, the other thing, nice thing about forums is that you have a choice about whether you make them fully open to the web, which means that they turn up in searches. If people Google for a particular topic, then it will bring that forum page to the front. Um, but you can also make them a closed community um, where people have to register and maybe their registration has to be approved by a moderator before they take part. So you can make a completely closed community using exactly the same technology. Um, one of the, the drawbacks is that they're not always that good at stuff other than text. A lot of them will take images, but it can be a bit clunky. Um, and I, I looked around to see what, whether there's a sort of good free platform 
uh, for, for web forums. There are a few around, but the, the, there wasn't one that immediately sprang to mind. And that makes me think, we worry a little bit that some of these free providers may not be available for the long term. But it is, of course, possible to host them on your own server or on a cloud instance if you have the skill to do that and you have the resources. Um, so yeah, uh, definitely something to, to, to consider. And they are obviously still quite widely used in a, in a number of uh, contexts. I know a number of the professional institutions and societies tend to, uh, tend to use web forums within their own websites. Okay, moving on, um, Facebook groups. Um, this one I've picked, picked here again, because I've got a cryospheric science background. Uh, this is the Facebook group for the International Glaciological Society, where, which is predominantly, uh, it tends not to be much in the way of discussion. It tends to be postings of links to um, journal publications, um, webinars, um, events that are going on tend to be advertised there. Um, the Facebook groups are a very easy way to create a discussion group and post items of interest, but I would counsel a little bit again, uh, the, the risk with Facebook is that Facebook really wants your real identity. Uh, not everyone is happy with that, especially in the LGBTQ plus community. Um, I certainly find I use Facebook less and less these days. And um, I would, again, think carefully, if your audience is already uh, on Facebook, then Facebook is a good place to use it, but I wouldn't necessarily start a new community on Facebook these days. Okay, moving on. Um, there is a um, one of the more popular tools at the moment uh, is Slack, which is a commercial tool intended primarily for use within a single company or within a single organization. And it does get used for online communities, but I would um, warn you a little bit against using Slack for running a public online community uh, because it's, um, it's not designed for use in a, in a op on the open internet, it's intended for use within a single company. Um, and so it has almost no tools for moderation. Um, Slack have been criticized about this a number of times uh, and they say, well, this is a workplace tool. So any penalties for misbehavior should be dealt with through the normal process of being disciplined by your manager. Um, and so that um, means that uh, whilst I have seen Slack used quite a lot for communities within uh, academia, within science, um, it works very well if it's a small tight group um, and where you all understand one another and I would not want to run a public community on it. The other limitation with Slack is that the free version um, has a limited history on it. So the, the history of what's happening disappears if you, uh, after a certain period of time, unless you pay for it. They do have the option of um, uh, an educational and nonprofit discount. And one of the organizations I'm involved with that uses Slack um, has been able to get a good discount on Slack. So that is worth thinking about. But it's quite a good way to run the internals of an organization, but it's not necessarily great for as a public community. So finally, I'm going to talk about uh, Discord, which is uh, what we are using to run the EGU Pride community and is my current favorite. Um, it has a slightly quirky history. Um, it developed originally as a communication tool for people playing multiplayer online games. So actually its most basic feature is not the text-based chat that you see here on the picture, but actually an audio call. And actually this has been subsequently extended to make a, a video as well. So you can use it like a Zoom call. It lets you talk to people in real time and it supports screen sharing. So um, uh, in a more flexible way, multiple people can share their screen and you can, and any, any one user can flip back and forth between looking at different people's screens. Um, but you can have multiple channels and switch between them very easily. You can have text channels, audio channels. You can have different things going on at the same time. Uh, it does have nice support for images and video uh, and emoji and stuff like that. And it works well on phones and tablets. Um, what I, the main reason I like Discord is because of its history in gaming and being on the open internet it has really excellent moderation features. And the Discord company that runs it um, provide a very helpful guide to how to run a server and how to moderate it and how to uh, how to encourage good behavior on a server. Um, it is free. Um, it's paid for by a company. Um, the way their business model works is that you pay for bonus features, and it, um, but they, uh, the, the free version is certainly extremely usable. There is always a risk, of course, that you lose the community if the, if the company collapses, but that's true of lots of things on the internet. Um, the other thing I would um, like to say uh, with with Discord is that it, yeah, it's um, 
Uh, it's been uh, used very successfully at a few conferences. In fact, at EGU 2020, I went to a poster session in Discord, which was run by Rolf Hutt from um, one of the universities in the Netherlands. My apologies, Rolf, if he's on the call. I forget which, which institution he belongs to. But he did that very cleverly, where he had an audio channel and a text channel for every single poster presenter within this Discord community. And that meant that you could literally browse around and talk to the different authors uh, as if you were in a real poster hall. And that was very clever. I found definitely um, put me onto the potential of Discord within science. So moving on a little bit, just talking about moderation. Um, so um, moderation is something that's really important. And, it, um, and so we have this concept within a community that there is an acceptable uh, policy of what kind of behavior is acceptable, a code of conduct, uh, and that somebody needs to be able to enforce that. And that is the role of a moderator. Um, and my message really is, is think about this from day one. Uh, if you're starting a new community, particularly if you're doing if you're going to post links to your community online, you will get undesirable people uh, one way or another. And it's best to be prepared and have a process for dealing with it. Now, we when we set up EGU, the EGU Pride Discord server, um, initially, um, because I created it, I was the uh, uh, server owner and had power to do everything. And then in the first week, we kind of said, OK, as a community, we're going to choose some moderators. We're going to make uh, and choose a set of rules. And we and we then did that and set that up. So now we've never needed the moderation tools, but it's um, but they're there in case we need them. So it's definitely something to think about if you're running an online community. You can't just expect that everyone will play nicely, unfortunately. And then sort of finally, I, I want to talk about um, the risk with a lot of online communities is that they fizzle out, that there's an initial burst of enthusiasm and then nothing happens because everybody drifts away to do other things. And so it's really important, particularly in the early stages of community, but also on an ongoing basis, and I, I do need to get a little bit better at doing this, um, that we create regular small interactions that, in, that encourages people to be on the online platform. Um, that we you know, try and arrange for people to, to, to chat with one another, that we put updates, we post um, and enliven the community, because otherwise, you, if, if, if nothing happens, then nobody will, nobody will take part, nobody will look. Um, and so the other nice thing that we tend to do is to, we tend to try and arrange periodic synchronous events so we, where we all meet up together, whether that's online or in person. Um, and that helps to kind of reinforce the community and bring everyone back together. And obviously, um, with General Assembly as well, um, and being in a hybrid format now, uh, we've got the opportunity to meet in person and online. And Anita was talking earlier about the online icebreaker. This is one of the things we learned from the 2021 uh, experience of the General Assembly is that uh, that was online that year over two weeks. And we had a um, and by having our EGU Pride meeting right at the beginning of those two weeks, that helped to create the community and get people who, to know one another in advance of the conference event. And so that's why we'd like to kind of take that on for the next General Assembly to have this online icebreaker, get people so that they know, get to know people, get, get to know a friend, um, get to know who's interested in their research. And then they feel that they're a bit more included when they actually meet up in the, in the real event. So that's all we have for you in terms of the, the presentation. I'm just going to, to leave you with the, um, the point that there are uh, the EGU Pride Discord server. I'm going to put the link in the chat very shortly when I close the presentation, uh, an invitation link if you would like to come and join us on the Discord server. Uh, and also to remind you that tomorrow is LGBTQIA plus in STEM day. STEM is science, technology, engineering and mathematics. Um, we're celebrating people working in those fields. And it's also um, Pride in Polar Research, which is a, a LGBTQ plus group for people specifically working in polar research, which is my field and Marix as well. Um, uh, is they're having special event tomorrow as well. So uh, look, keep an eye on your Twitter for that. And I'm, I'm sure there will be lots of exciting stuff going on. So thank you very much. And any questions? Yeah, so please use the Q&A box on the bottom of the, uh, uh, the Zoom to, to answer questions if you, if you would like to. While we wait for the, anything to come through, I'm just going to ask, um, I'm going to ask Marek and Anita just to comment on the value of a local organization within your institution um, uh, versus the, the, the value of a um, um, the, the value of an, in, uh, an international network. There is a question of, uh, of from Jenny, and 
maybe we can keep your question uh, for the panel list uh, active for later. Yeah, fine. Yeah. I will read it uh, out loud. Um, so as an ally, I'm not sure whether to sign up to Discord server and attend events. I don't want to take up space from an LGBTQIA plus member or take over the safe space, but equally, I want to be a better ally and interact with the LGBTQI plus scientists. Is there a good balance? You want to answer, Mike, or I go? Uh, I, 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 I can comment, but I equally... Um... You can you do you want do you want to comment first? I can you you go on. first. I'll go first. Okay. Um, so yeah, I would say that there's there's um, the the balance with this is essentially um, you're a guest. If you come into our space, you're a guest in our space, and so the, uh, you're very welcome. But you're but you you should bear in mind that you're def you're definitely a guest uh, in that environment, and that you know that the um, you should you shouldn't uh, then attempt to then uh, set the agenda and drive the discussion um, you're there primarily to listen or you know to to connect with people on a friendly basis but I'm interested to hear what Marek and Anita think yes I I I think um, the role of allies is very very important and sometimes what it's missed maybe is just to ask a question that you never asked and you want to um, so I guess the, of course, the, mm, it, there is a code of conduct and there is, uh, there is, it's, it's a safe place. So we need to bear that in mind. But if one has a question, I find this very useful because then you can kind of also represent that question and bring it outside the community and help answer doubts that you had or questions or anything. So I would welcome allies um, and and to to join the, the the groups, people can can identify uh, or not identify or come out or not, and be just welcome in the community. Um, uh, of course, uh, you know, as as you as you want to support how to find out how to support the community, Discord channel is a good place. Um, at the same time, maybe you 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 want to stay there and look. It, it's it's uh, it's good as well, uh, but also interacting. I think it's a good component of the benefit of the community. Just bearing in mind, there is a is a community that is focused on on some topics that we just mentioned, and and it's a safe place. So if if anything bad happen, then we have the moderator role, the moderator's role. Sorry. So. Mark, do you want to add? Yeah, something? I would. I would add that I think it's it's just like a, a topic where it's like there's a lot of pros and cons on every side, and I think in the special case of the EGU Pride server yet, as we haven't really talked as a serve like within the the community yet so much, I think it's kind of like a good reminder of us to think about how we want to handle the the Discord server. So we are still in the process of setting it up and step like, like not setting it up from the baseline, but like establishing how we want to use it for what especially. And I think for the for the there there are parts of it which would be nice to have allies in for the for the action part where we wrote now or drafted letters in the pronoun change. That is something where it would be nice to to get help and where you don't want to load all the work in that regard just on the on the shoulders of the queer people or queer scientists. But in the other place, like keeping a safe space. So maybe that's just a question we can't really answer yet because we haven't talked, like we are just like three people kind of like blasting out their opinions. So I think it's a good note for the future to that we think, oh, do we want to have a ally subgroup in that channel? Do we don't want like how to how to handle that? And I think the general answer is. It's, 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 there are benefits in everything. And if you want to support people, I mean, you're here today, which is a good, good start. And also being to, to going to the events, sharing the events and announcements, and maybe just like at the first, having to look out what we, what we announce publicly could be, is a good start. So, but I think that is mostly the questions, mostly for us to, a reminder to think about that. <laughs> Um, yes, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for the question, Jenny. And I would continue reading out the second question. So we got an anonymous question. 
how would you recommend going about setting up an LGBTQ plus network space within a university department, especially ensuring that the organization and effort doesn't just fall on the shoulders of one person? I can maybe just bluntly say I don't have experience with that because I come from a really, really small department, as in we were sometimes less than 10 students per year. So that was nothing on my priority list. Um, so I would hand over to, to the other people who have maybe some more experience with that. Anita, do you want to add anything? Yeah, I would like to add that uh, as for setting up a, a, a group, you, you kind of first uh, want to find exactly some other people because it, at the beginning, it's kind of a bit of an inevitable that one person starts it. But then, um, then by doing some socializing events, um, you can find the support in the community that is there. Um, as Marek said, it, the volunteer is very small. It could be that uh, it's hard at the beginning, but that doesn't mean that it's not useful. It can be really useful uh, for people that are not that do not feel comfortable, and they can find a good support, even if it's just few people from the beginning. EGU 2019, few people, and then it's growing, and then we have a Discord channel. And the EGU, it's a, it can, I would say it's quite a big uh, community um, with thousands of, 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 uh, of members. Um, yes, as I want to stress also that the Discord group is a group, and we are just three people expressing our opinions, but uh, of course, we may not represent all of them. Um, but then when you start and from a I don't know, a coffee, a coffee, a social coffee, or I don't know. And then from there, um, you can start uh, growing in your department or also a university level, even um, if the department is not very big. Uh, Mike, do you want to add something? Yeah, I'm just going to add. So I, what I would say, I think it, it, it's a really nice thing to do within your department if you can get the critical mass of people. And I would say that you you really need two or three people as a minimum to get it going. Um, and looking at some of the organizations um, that have done this well in the past, places that I've worked or places I know where colleagues have worked, um, it's often possible to get your, um, don't, don't neglect your technical, your administrative staff and the um, teaching staff uh, within the university. Um, certainly within my department, it's been really interesting to meet people and discover that you know several, several of our technicians are LGBTQ plus people um, you know, and meet them and, and build, a, build a better connection that way. Um, so yeah, try and get a small community. Um, if you are worried about not having enough support, then go and if you can go and talk to somebody in a managerial responsibility, you know, maybe a head of department, maybe um, somebody who has a responsibility for pastoral care. Uh, in research institutions, I've actually seen the HR department often help uh, make that work. Um, so yeah, those are all places you can go. But you start, yeah, start with a, a core group of two or three people who are interested in making it happen, and then try and grow it organically from there. But it, it will be a certain amount of work. And if it doesn't, also don't be afraid to let it fizzle out if it's not going to work. Um, and maybe combine it with, uh, you know, a university-wide network or a, you know, a, a go bigger if you need to. Uh, if you don't have enough critical mass to make it work. Hope that was helpful. Um, I would like to add another comment on, on this. I think that uh, it's, uh, uh, it's also important uh, where, in which country, and what the background is, because of course we would all hope that HR is helpful, mm. but sometimes can be not helpful, if not the opposite. Uh, I'm not saying from my personal experience but I can easily imagine in reality where it's harder so then there could be uh, other informal ways to to find the community um, that is out there and so if it's not if it's it's not a formal way then there is somebody in the in the university that can can join a community um, and in, in other countries, in my experience, sometimes there is a kind of a stronger structure in the departments 
lecturer, then uh, it's, it's different kind of structured lecturer, students, they don't connect and talk too much sometimes. Um, but if that is not the case, then it's actually quite helpful, as Mike said, to find people in, in the entire department. Um, it is at the beginning easier probably from your, so if it's a postdoc or if it's a, a student, um, it's probably easier to start the dialogue, but that doesn't mean that, uh, you know, what, what I mean is usually you're not alone. <laughs> Very much so. Thank you. Any more questions or should we come back to, to Mike's question from the beginning? Anita, you were starting to, to answer the question from Mike about the online and in-person communities and the benefits. I think I rem if I remember that question right, it was in that direction. Um, is, so it, we were talking about uh, uh, the advantages of having an in-person community and an online community. This is what you're saying. So yeah. I would guess that the, it's the size also and the, how you reach uh, the community. So if you can be in person, it's got a value that, uh, that it's, uh, it's very hard to, to substitute with the online events. But at the same time, the online um, gathering and communities would allow participation from countries and places where it's actually really hard to find a community. So the, I, in my opinion, the benefit of having a, a in like a physical uh, or lying a physical um, a group, it's invaluable. Um, but now that we are all moving to more of an online uh, life in a way, that the social events are also online, I think it's it's really a great opportunity to connect to people that would, you would not imagine to meet outside the department, outside your area of expertise, of study. Here we are polar researchers and paleomagnetists talking about things that, you know, you cannot imagine otherwise. So that's a, really a, a great value of, of this, um, of these uh, online um, communities. Mike, do you want to add something? Yeah, I, uh, only very briefly, to just to say that yeah, if you can if you can build a local network that pr that provide that supports you on a day to day, week to -day, week basis with your colleagues, that's really great. Uh, and then you know you can end up being a member of multiple overlapping networks uh, um, uh, with different organisations. Um, and you know there are there are some networks which are tight and some which are broad. So you know there are there is there are organisations. In my field, there are organizations for people working just in polar research and then in geoscience and then in science and technology and engineering more generally. Uh, and I've been involved a little bit with all with, with organizations at all sorts of levels. So I think there is real value in a in a plurality of networks and um, having the opportunity to uh, um, take part in those networks really is, is really valuable. Um, yeah. I think I just would like to add one point about online networks. So for me, like I, I, I feel like there's no place or time where it's too early to engage in the online network of your research field. So like conferences are expensive and even for early career science or just for like for master students, it's really expensive to go to a conference but it nearly costs you nothing to, to join a webinar or to, to engage in the early career scientists, researchers, however they are called groups from your research field. And I started doing that at the end, like not EGU Pride specific, but I started that in regards to polar science at the end of my bachelor. And that was immensely valuable for me because I got to know how people do research in other places, got to know other younger or like early career scientists. And it helped me ease into the feeling of going to conferences or like meeting with all the strange, not unfamiliar, fancy people I know from publications or stuff like that. And this, I have the same feeling with EGU Pride. So on the next physical meeting, I would be rather easy because I already know people and I kind of like experience in a safe online environment. And that is something which is incredibly valuable because online communities have such a low low entry level 
also you can engage and get active if you want to change something or want to get active online communities are have a really low engage level because normally there's always somebody needed to edit a presentation to read through a text or you can collaborate so so easily so i would encourage you just like not only for pride but also for other things if you if you want to get active in your research field or in your like in the small one in the in the geoscience field or in the climate field whatever the field it is there will be a place or a community out there where you can engage and where you can push topics and when you can have rather faster feeling of having an impact. And that is something I really enjoy about online communities. So, thank you, Mary. That's really, that's a really insightful point. I think I would like to, I think we've, unless there are any remaining burning questions, I think we should wrap it up there. Uh, we've had our just over 45 minutes. It's been really interesting and thank you all for coming. Uh, and then um, uh, just a reminder to everyone that took part that if you would like any, uh, if you think that you would like the questions you asked, I don't think there was any too, much, too many issues with it, but if you would like any of the questions you'll ask edited out of the recording, because it will be, the, the whole webinar will be available on the EGU's uh, video channels uh, after the event. So uh, let us know um, if you if would like that, if you would like that removed. Um, yeah, thank you very much, everyone. And um, yeah. Wish, wish you a, a very good afternoon and uh, hope to see you maybe on our Discord server if that's of interest to you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks, and thanks for organizing it and being in the background, Simon. Yeah, thank you, Simon. Yeah. <laughs> bye.